Welcome to the Theology in Progress podcast, where we want to grow in Christ through every conversation. Do you have doubts and questions about the Christian life? Join Chris, Brandon, and Josh as they tackle the tough issues to gain clarity, find answers, and become better disciples of Jesus Christ. This is the Theology in Progress podcast, where our goal is to ask questions, seek understanding, so we can better know God. I'm Chris. And I'm Josh. And speaking of asking questions and seeking understanding, we have a very special announcement to bring you guys. Josh and I have finished our, I want to say first, but it's not our first, but no, it's, it's like our, our third. Yeah. I don't know, something like it that. It is our newest ebook that we have. I think it's our best, though. <laughs> it is definitely our best, and it is our longest as well. Um, anyway, it, our ebook, The Quick Guide to Gaining Clarity. So what we have done is we have taken the top 10 theological questions that are most often asked by church people today and we have written a little ebook on each of those questions and so real short ebook um just a few short words per question and our and our goal with this is really not to give you all of the answers we really want to help you think through the answers yeah like we do in you know most of our podcasts here we're, we're not trying to just tell you what to think we want to help you yeah in our journey and in, in learning how to process these yeah. difficult questions. Because some of these questions have no good answers. That's true. And so what do, you, what do you do as a Christian when you try to figure out a question that doesn't have a good answer? Mm -hmm. Well, well and, and you discover most of the time we're asking the wrong question. Yeah. That's why there's no really good answer. But they're difficult questions you can't always find the answer to, but there is definitely a way to move forward and to make progress in your faith, to not stop moving and not remain stagnant in your faith. And so that's the, one of the big things that we really wanted to um, convey in this ebook. So, like our other ebooks, though, this one is absolutely free. We just want to give it away to you guys and, um, you know, try to provide as much help as, as we can and, and provide you with the resources um, that we can. So, if we'll, put, we'll put a link in the show notes for you guys. Uh, you can also go to our, our homepage and see the on the, the right hand side of the page. Mm -hmm giant cover image that says the quick guide to getting clarity and then you can put in your email address and your name and yep we'll send you a free copy so theologyinprogress.com and you can download our free ebook the quick guide to gaining clarity and that will give you our answers to the top 10 theological questions that you have questions and doubts on and speaking of doubts this is like God ordained stuff right here right it, it, it really is and uh, we have a special guest for you today she is an author that's right she we have another woman on the podcast we're very proud of that <laughs> um erica bartholo has written a book we both know erica through different means which is kind of cool because we were talking about after the podcast yeah um just how <laughs> just weird relationships are formed in in the ag and and uh different another example of good god ordained relationships um yeah. but anyway Erica has written a book called Holy Doubt, kind of chronicling her time as a missionary in India and her descent in battle with depression during that time. And it is a wonderful story. Number one, just an excellent book to read and, and great read, great stories. But man, this thing will challenge you to yeah. a whole nother level. Yeah, when I – so I first started reading it uh, beginning of – what was today? Yeah, beginning of last week. Mm -hmm. And I literally couldn't put it down. Yeah, it the was, book just came out. Yeah, it was that good. Um, and it has value, I would I would argue, for every single Christian. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just that important of a thing to, to discuss. Um, it's just the name of the book itself, Holy Doubt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How can doubt be holy? <laughs> That's right. We, we don't look at doubt as a good thing, mm -hmm. but as she makes it abundantly clear in, in her experience and in going through what she went through, doubt's a very good thing, and it can be a gift. Yeah, and we've experienced that oh, here yeah. on Theology in yeah, Progress, yeah, yeah. and so that's why Erica is a great guest to have. We are so happy to feature this book, and again, we cannot recommend this book more highly. Like Again, you need to go out, buy a copy of this, 
you know, you can get it on Amazon. I think it's only nine dollars on Amazon. Only nine dollars for the paperback on yeah. Amazon. Nine dollars for the paperback right now, four dollars for the Kindle. I mean, you that that's just a steal. Honestly, you need to go and take advantage of this because it is an excellent book. It's going to help you. And again, just like we were talking about with our little ebook, Erica does not try to give you all of the answers. She deals with a lot of struggles and she gives you her personal um journey that she went through and she came through one of the darkest moments in her life on the other side knowing god more having a deeper relationship all the things that you want out of the christian life but she had to discover that there was a lot of suffering that went in that process that we don't always talk about or don't always want to acknowledge so anyway look i don't want to take up any more time we got to get to this interview because it really is that good, and uh, it's a little longer than usual. But, but hang in there; it's worth it. Yeah, it's it, it's such a good good story. So please enjoy our interview with Erica Bartholo. All right, we are here with Erica Bartholo. Uh, Erica, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really glad that we were able to have you on. You have written a really cool book called Holy Doubt. And I've got to say, it was it was an incredible book. Um, almost couldn't put it down. I think I read the whole thing in, in just two sh- short yeah. sittings. And, yeah, I did uh, too. And one of them was just because, you know, I came up against like midnight and I said, well, I probably should get some sleep. And so, um, <laughs> although it was kind of hard to sleep, one, I felt a little guilty that I got to be so comfortable. But two, <laughs> I was also imagining giant spiders maybe crawling around my room oh, and all that. So, sorry about that. Uh, sorry about no, that. it was it was fine. But uh, <laughs> I felt kind of like, oh, man, this is great. And you have so much comfort. Anyway, we'll get into that and you'll understand more if you're listening. And you don't get that yet. But um, basically, Erica and her husband, Jonathan, were missionaries to India and Through this experience, Erica came through with um, just some incredible struggles and doubts and and an incredible opportunity to grow her faith, and we're going to get into a little bit of that. But first, I thought we would start before the beginning of where you start your book, because I want to hear about your call into missions. So tell us a little bit about what what your calling was into missions and, and how maybe you and Jonathan met and got on that path together. Sure. Um, we actually met in Bible college and I knew that he was called to missions. And at the time I did not feel the same call. (laughs) Um, so we had a little come to Jesus date, (laughs) not too, not too far into the relationship where I told him how I was feeling and he was kind of devastated and didn't want to break up. And he was like, let's, let's pray about it. And so we both prayed about it and um, God just really changed my heart and started to give me a burden for um, missions. And I felt very confident that Jonathan was the man for me. And that kind of just confirmed the call even more. And so that was kind of how we started out on this missions journey. But he had a dream when he was 17, that he would go to India, which I did not have such a dramatic call. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so because he had felt called into missions, then the Lord slowly worked on your heart, and you, you also felt that call to India as well? I did. Yeah, because you talk about in a book, you know, feeling, you know, very excited, and, and you, you talk about, I think, in the first chapter, you know, you guys were going with such excitement, and expecting to start a revolution and, right. and, all, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so tell me, I, I want to know a little bit too about just your experience with the, the romanticism with missions and how that began to crash around you. <laughs> Cause then what I want to ask is what your advice would be to somebody who's considering missions now. Okay. Um, Yeah, I mean, I grew up in an Assemblies of God church, and I've got to say that missionaries were pretty much almost idolized, if you can Mm -hmm. use that word, and people kind of put them on a whole different level, and so that was my experience. I don't come from a ministry family, and so I didn't really have any kind of inside access to see how 
things really work. Um, and so I think that in a lot of ways, I expected missions to look the way I had always seen it portrayed when missionaries came to speak at our church. And when they came to speak at church, it was always um, about the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and so, and I totally get it because that's what people want to hear. That's Nobody what that's wants, what gets the money in. <laughs> right. Nobody wants to listen to a missionary cry for an hour about how terrible it is. <laughs> and so I completely get it. But since that was all that I had ever heard, and that was not what I was experiencing when we finally got on the field, I really just felt like a failure. Did you feel at that point then that some of those missionaries had, did you feel lied to in that way or that they just had completely different experiences than you? I honestly thought that I was like the only one who wasn't mm. crushing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, like even my husband was having an incredible time. Like he mm. loved India and everything about it. Like he thrived and aside from the fact that I did not, mm -hmm. um, he yeah. loved it. Although, in his defense, I think he could find a way to have an incredible time about anywhere. You know, he he does know how to have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> so the giant spiders crawling above the bed every night didn't bother him too much? They didn't really seem to, although we really couldn't have handled two people no. freaking out about a spider. <laughs> <laughs> You just take turns or something. Just, yeah, I may have just been keeping it together for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've hinted at the, the story a little bit uh, enough. I want to. I want to jump right in. But first, your book is called "Holy Doubt: Finding Hope When Faith Is a Struggle," and I really want to just start with that title. Why the title "Holy Doubt"? It's such a. It's a good title. It is intriguing. It makes you have to grab that book and open it. But tell me a little bit, like, what does that mean, and why did you choose it? Well, I'm glad that it caught your attention. That was part of the reason for the title. But I just, I liked the idea of almost an oxymoron. Two words that don't seem like they go together. And just the way that they actually do go together um, was intriguing to me and hopefully gets people thinking and becomes clear as they read more in the story. And, um, that was kind of the thinking behind it and to grab people's attention. <laughs> mm -hmm. So can you sum up for us then just give us a little, a, a brief overview of, of kind of you arrived on the field, you were feeling really good and excited. And so um, a lot of what you cover in chapter two, but just for our audience, just give us a brief synopsis of kind of the descent into the struggle that you began having uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Sure. Um, I think it wasn't just, it was a pretty quick <laughs> descent for one thing. Um, and it wasn't just one thing. It was probably a lot of, little things that combined together that kind of added up and what I think it was at the heart of it all was that I felt like I had moved to this place, sacrificed some things and felt like I had been duped or tricked somehow because once I got there, it felt like God wasn't there with me. Um, and like he had abandoned me <laughs> and that just kind of became the final straw. I started having panic attacks, which I'd never had before in my life. And it was just all a lot of things mm -hmm. happening at once of, yeah. that I just didn't quite know how to process. And so you were living at the top of this mountain or this little mountain village and you guys were living, like, it sounds like at a little shack off by yourselves in the jungle. <laughs> um, that is not too far from the truth. <laughs> and one of your back doors had a giant gaping hole in it that... 
Yes, yes. Was Actually, letting the in these door. rodents of unusual size, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by the way, the spiders I could have lived with. The rats? Oh the my rats goodness. <laughs> that was that was the final straw. <laughs> yeah. You you tell you tell a story in the book about you you were having this constant fear and anxiety about these giant rats that were you said the size of like a small cat or something, right? Yes. Yes. And it's just not right. You were you were <laughs> putting putting out lots of traps and catching multiples of these things. So Yes. You know, there was a, this was a big problem and you said you were having this incredible anxiety of picturing these rats, you know, biting your children's arms and faces and um you know, I, I can imagine because I've laid awake at night just imagining, you know, uh, you know, kidnappers coming to steal my kids away. So, I, I mean, I can relate very well to that that level of it's anxiety. It's a parental around. thing. Yeah, I know. But tell us the story about when you realized that your fear was actually well-founded. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I don't even think that my friend who told me that story realized how much it freaked me out. So <laughs> when she told me that story, I'm sure that was the one thing that initially, like, I was really good at hiding my reactions and my feelings and my fears. And so I think when she told me that story, she probably had no idea that mm-hmm. I was so freaked out. And if I showed any emotion, she probably thought that it was all for Maheshwari. But, oh, it was not. <laughs> It was, oh, my mind was going all sorts of places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what did she tell you? So we were sitting in this cafe and she told me that the lady who helped in her house, who was like family to them, um, had to go to the hospital because she had, a, she thought she was dreaming and she woke up and found a rat biting her face. Mm-hmm. She thought her husband was kissing her and it was a rat. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, so no, no. that that was oh, the story that just huh. really put me over <laughs> over the edge. <laughs> yeah, so well, So through this so through this difficult time of all of these events, which like you described, you know, were not baseless fears that these things could actually and were actually happening to people um you began to have a a pretty hard time i guess to to put it mildly can you describe um a a little bit of of i guess i don't know for lack of a better word the descent that you had into you know you're struggling with faith and 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 doubt and all that because we you know here at theology of progress we like to say we want to embrace those things. Um, you talk a lot about how you felt very guilty uh, and, and put down, and that's the case with with most Christians. Is we're, we're a lot of times felt or are, are left feeling alone and like we're, we're yeah. forced to struggle on these things by ourselves. Because yeah. if we were to tell anybody about them, we would not be accepted. We would be rejected or just given some sort of platitude of like, well, you know, just go read the Bible because that's where you know, all the answers are. So can you tell us a little bit about what your struggle looked like? And, and I mean, you got to a really low point. So uh, give us, give us that description of where you were (laughs) and then how you got to that low point. (laughs) Sure. I think, um, it only took me three months of living in that situation to really just kind of spiral completely out of control. And, we were celebrating my son's fourth birthday and I had just dealt with a temper tantrum that he had had. Wasn't so much a temper tantrum as he was just sad. He wanted to know why his grandparents couldn't be at his birthday party. Oh man. And, and I, I just, I had no explanation for that. And he was sad we had his party and the next day I went for a walk and I was walking on this thin mountain path and I just thought, 
I don't think this is ever going to end. This is every day is going to be as miserable as the last. And I really thought that my family at this point, I was not functioning well. And I thought that they might be better off without me. And I thought about possibly ending my life on the side of that mountain because it seemed hopeless. And the strange thing is, is that I, up to that point, I don't think anybody knew that I felt that way. I don't even think that my husband knew I felt that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I finally, like, I, it scared me to think that I was willing to do that to just make it all stop. And so I went home and I told Jonathan and um, I think he was shocked and scared. I know he was scared. And um, so we ended up talking with our boss and he suggested that we get to Thailand for some counseling and some help. And that was the best thing (laughs) that we could have done. Yeah, Mm -hmm. That that feeling of being alone is just, crazy and the more i talk to to christians i find that they feel that all the time just the the struggles that they go through in life whether it's with sin or suffering or or anything else they feel like they're literally the only christians who are dealing with this thing in this way right and so what you were talking about earlier with uh, the way that we put missionaries up on a pedestal and, and kind of glamorize what they're going through I feel like we do the same thing a lot with the Christian life because what we see on Sunday mornings, what we hear preached about, those are the highlights. But we never really get down and talk about the the stuff that we have to wade through in everyday life that drags us down and, and beats us down and continually threatens us with our worst fears. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so that... If if anyone's listening who's thinking uh, maybe it's, that's just a missionary story, no, it's take it to heart. That's something that every Christian can experience as well. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things that I really wanted to. I know sometimes people feel like missionaries aren't relatable. <laughs> yeah. Um, because of that reason, they think that they're on some higher spiritual plane. But I wanted to really draw the point to say that no, we're normal people. And yeah. even a missionary, I'm just a normal person. And I've had struggles with my faith. And I was, my ultimate goal with the book was to let people know that they're not alone. Mm-hmm. So how has your experience then i mean you had an extreme experience (laughs) um (laughs) where most people in the states that are going to read this don't necessarily they can really i bet you we can relate to the emotion in the feeling in our own way but we can't necessarily relate to the story so what would you tell somebody who's who maybe instead of feeling uplifted by that might feel like oh well who am i to even have the struggles that I do, you know, what what would you tell somebody like that reading that that doesn't have the exact same experience, but has the same feelings of emotion? Oh, sure. We, I think one of the things that I learned through this entire thing is that there's just no comparing our pain and experiences with each other. Like they are That's good. what you experience your pain, your suffering, your trials more mm-hmm. than what I could ever understand. And so the thing that I really came away from it with was I do not ever <laughs> think that anybody doesn't have as much to, to deal with that. I dealt with or that my situation was like the ultimate terror. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I just, I really try not to compare Mm -hmm. and say, Oh, well my, my stuff is harder than your stuff. Cause it's just, it's not a real thing. Like everybody has hard stuff and it's, 
we just seem to support each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it seemed like you were getting at that. Uh, tell us a little bit about the story of, of the the prayer that you prayed that you felt kind of was your way of saying, all right, God, take me through this whole process. Right. <laughs> the prayer that kind of backfired for a while. <laughs> uh, so we were youth pastors before we went to the mission field. And I just remember thinking I was sitting in my living room surrounded by toys and Caillou. And <laughs> everybody shames me for liking Caillou. I like Caillou. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You might want to cut that from the, <laughs> like this lady's crazy. Uh, uh, we'll we'll play the theme song behind that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, excellent. Parents of young okay. children, uh, <laughs> there's no judgment. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I um I just thought there has to be more to life as a Christian and there has to be more to a relationship with God than what I am experiencing right now. And I felt like um, my relationship with God was kind of stunted and shallow. And so I prayed (laughs) to know God better. And it seems like a very innocent, simple prayer. And then um, when I met with my counselor (laughs) and she suggested that those three months of living hell that I had lived through Mm -hmm. maybe the answer to that prayer I was like what is wrong with this woman (laughs) 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 not how God's supposed to answer this (laughs) (laughs) This is not what I meant when I prayed that (laughs) yeah (laughs) Uh, you did you did and ask your either in the book you either asked yourself or asked the question just straight up or somebody asked you maybe would could, could you have learned this lesson a different way? And I think in the book you said no. Right. I I am a stubborn, stubborn lady. <laughs> so I actually, you know, it's possible that other people could absolutely learn these lessons in a much different way. But for me, um, I think it was exactly what I needed for God to get through to me. And um, even though it was difficult, it was really the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's an important point for for us to really latch on to, is that God doesn't always answer our prayers the way that we want him to, <laughs> right? And, um, like, we, one of the things that we talk about a lot, Josh and I, is that, uh, actually, it's a C.S. Lewis quote where he said, a lot of our theological questions that we ask about God is like asking how fast is the color yellow? <laughs> that question just doesn't quite compute. It's it, We're asking, we're using the wrong language to ask things of God. And so uh, I, I like that illustration to just help me remember that God works in totally different ways than how I think. Right. And so I love to hear that, you know, even though you asked a question, which we should all be asking. <laughs> we should all want to have a deeper, closer, better relationship, you know, with God, right? And genuinely mean that. But when it comes to us in a way that we don't expect and <laughs> or like. Or like, <laughs> or like. And we should expect suffering in the Christian life, right? I mean, right. You, like you go on to say that like this in the Bible is more of the norm than the exception. Right. But I honestly had never really experienced that growing up in my Mm -hmm. kind of sheltered Midwest church Mm -hmm. surroundings. I had not experienced a whole lot of suffering or even seen a lot of people who Mm -hmm. had gone through a lot of suffering because if they did, I probably just didn't see it because I was a kid, but (laughs) um, I'm sure that they did, Mm -hmm. but but yeah, the I Christian Christian life means that you don't suffer, right? Right. So that was kind <laughs> of the the idea that I came away with from my upbringing in church was mm-hmm. that if you're a good Christian, you won't suffer because God's going to make you be, you know, he's going to cause everything that you do to be perfect and you're going to be happy every day and mm-hmm. it just was not 
what I experienced in <laughs> India. Yeah. yeah, and one of the one of the problems with that is we end up having to just put on a face so that we can make everybody think that we're experiencing those same, th same things. Because then if we're not, then there's obviously something wrong with us. So what is it like, so you had just, you'd gone to Thailand, you were in counseling. How long did it take you to kind of like pull your facade down? Or did you still struggle with it even after that point of still trying to put on, you know, the perfect act? Well, I think the great thing about kind of falling apart on the mountainside was I kind of, I just, I really did decide to just be done with God because I felt like he had caused all of these things, these bad things, and it was his fault that I was experiencing all of that. And so when I reached that point, I really felt like, well, I don't have anything left to lose. And so um, I thought when I got to the counselor, I was pretty rough and honest. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that that was probably the best thing because mm -hmm. from that point forward, I was kind of able to let down the mask mm -hmm. and just really be honest enough to work through things. Yeah. Because before I felt like I needed to manage perceptions mm -hmm. and make people think that I had it together and that I could handle the things that were coming at me. And um, then I finally realized <laughs> nobody's fooled. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm in counseling here in Thailand and I really just, I didn't have anything left to lose. And I just was willing to talk to anybody and everybody who would listen. <laughs> and fortunately I had a great group of people that were willing to listen. And one of the things that really helped was I went to a retreat for the Southeast Asian missionaries um for the women and one of the ladies there shared a story which i shared in the book about a dream that she had and how she was really struggling with god while she was watching her mom die and i was like at this point i was really really not in a good place <laughs> and i didn't really want to be there but when she started talking i was like what <laughs> these other women have felt this way are you kidding me <laughs> and this lady who is an amazing woman has felt this way like it was eye-opening for me and I felt like that particular event was one of the things that really made me begin to shift my perspective um to see that God really did still care about me, even though I didn't think that he did. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's a great, a, a great illustration of, uh, of why I think it's such an, an important thing to, to, to share. And really the contribution that I think your book makes again for us is just to know that we're not alone and that it's okay to experience these doubts because you know, there's light on the other side of it. If we're willing to persevere <laughs> and, to, and, right. and to struggle with that doubt, you know, not right. shy away from it. Yeah. I, I feel like because, because of our culture is one that says that you have to be perfect. And if you're not, there's something wrong. We tend to shy away from those doubts instead of actually lean into them and say, no, 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 it's actually okay to question the Bible or to question God. Because and I think you, you make mention of this in the book. You know, if, if God is that big, he like he's going to show himself faithful. <laughs> you know, right. he's not he's not intimidated by my doubts or or my anger or anything like that, right? Right. And right. so I think I think it's such an important point to to recognize that there are other people that that have done that, and we can <clears throat> we can come through it as well. So that that's 
that leads into one of my other questions was what was the major turning point for you in this whole experience? I mean, you, you had in just three months, I mean, went from on top of the world to, I mean, literally staring down at the bottom of, of a cliff. And I mean, when you write that in the book, I thought you were speaking metaphorically. And then all of a sudden no. I had to go back and reread it. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, that's an intense, that, I mean, that's, that's yeah. an intense beginning. It was an intense three months. So I'll tell you that. Um, so what's this major turning point that began this, this return journey for you of saying, no, 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 I, I can get through this or, or, uh, you know, going from, I don't want to have anything to do with God to now your relationship with him is deeper than ever. Right. Um, I think the major turning point was just knowing that I didn't have anything to lose by being honest. And that ultimately that was what allowed me to dig deeper. And that story that that woman shared at the retreat was also a huge turning point for me. Um, just to realize that God did still care about me, that he had, knew that I would be in that room to hear that story um, registered with mm -hmm. me. Um, even though I wasn't quite ready to do anything with it at that point, it was just one of those things that kind of just primed my heart. And then I went back for more counseling, and the counseling really helped um, to have – this woman who looked at what I had experienced and said, I see hope in this, you know, I see God doing something incredible in your life through these experiences. Um, and that, that made a huge difference for me. Yeah. It seemed like she really did a good job of taking the pressure off too. I mean, I think you mentioned in the book, the first thing that she said was, Hey, let's go shopping. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> I said, sign me up for that. <laughs> it's the best way to start um, a counseling session. Yeah, I agree. That is the way that all counseling sessions should start. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that hits on another point you talk about, which I think is another really undervalued point in the church today, especially in our Western, very individualistic culture. And that is loneliness is we isolate ourselves from others and really what that counselor was doing was she broke down the barrier and saw you as a person right you weren't just a patient like you, you talk about another counselor who just kind of saw you as right. a number <laughs> right. and you, you know i think it, you, you mentioned at the end of the book how it's so important to to build relationships with people around you so that you can have and share those struggles. What is your support structure today look like um, to, 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 to maintain that same sort of, uh, you, you know, circle. So you don't fall back into that sort of thing. Are, are you more intentional about it than ever before? You know, that is an excellent question. We, it's crazy. When we moved back to the States, from India, I, um, Jonathan and I both really kind of struggled with the pace of life. We were, you know, we had to make appointments months down the road to hang out with friends because everybody's mm -hmm. schedule was so packed. And that was just not the case in India. Like everything was very much slower paced, a whole lot more laid back. You know, you'd call someone that day and say, Hey, I'm coming over. And they'd be like, great. I'll <laughs> fix some chai. <laughs> and so that's one of the things that I really kind of miss. Um, Cause it's just something that's missing in our culture. Mm -hmm. I think um, just the willingness to really make sure that you set aside time in your schedule to nurture those relationships um, 
And I've got to say, it's something that I don't do well enough. <laughs> it, it is a tough, it, it's a very tough thing to do to, and it's a precious gift when you can find somebody, you know, um, you, you describe one of your friends, um, uh, J Jenny, I believe, right. You know, that, that it was just there for you <laughs> no matter what. And yes. it's a very precious thing to find that sort of friend that you can just be totally open and honest with, you know, and, and, and to pour your doubts out too. And, 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 and no judgment. <laughs> right. Right. That's the key is finding somebody who it's, I have no idea if she ever was thinking, Oh my word, what in the world? <laughs> but She never let me know it. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, good. Sometimes that's just as good, right? <laughs> That yeah. it is, you know, I'll take whatever I can get. <laughs> it is, it is crazy though. Cause I mean, that can make us afraid to talk to pastors. It can make us afraid to, to talk to our spouses because we've seen people respond like that. We've seen them respond with judgment or just saying, Hey, you just need to get over it. Just pull yourself up and, and get over it. And right. that, or, that just shuts people down. Yeah. Or even pity. I yeah. hate to be pitied. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I would keep things to myself because I didn't want to be pitied. Because it's like, I don't yeah. need your pity. <laughs> yeah, well, pitying <laughs> people that... is just basically saying that you're worth less than I am. Right. And so I, yeah, nobody wants to feel that way. <laughs> no. So how has this impacted your and Jonathan's relationship? coming through this this hell <laughs> of an experience um what yeah. has that done for you guys you know for me it's made me appreciate what a wonderful man he is just his primary purpose was to make sure that i was okay and if he cared what other people thought i didn't know it um, and he just really loved me well in the middle of it and never tried to, um, I know he was worried. <laughs> I did know that, but he never tried to fix me. Mm. Um, and that was huge for me. I'm not, I'm not sure what he would say. <laughs> <laughs> about the whole experience at this point there's um i got some feedback from my launch team and they were like we want to know what jonathan was thinking during this whole thing yep. and i'm like you know what that would be interesting because now he knows exactly what i was thinking yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> holy doubt part two <laughs> right. right so i think i think we'll work on that so yeah <laughs> No, I was. I'm thinking the the a lot of the same thing. Like, I would like to get some of his uh, perspective in on on this as well. Just you know, <laughs> um, just because I I know it, you know, as a married person, this greatly affects both people. Even right. though, like, when you're in the middle of it, going through the depression, you know, it's so hard to even consider somebody else because you're just so worried about survival from day to day or moment to moment even right so right um so yeah no i i, I love that that's that's um that's that's good <laughs> so why did you guys move back to the u.s then well that is a really long answer um <laughs> the really short answer is that emotionally i could not handle another term mm -hmm in India. Mm -hmm. um, but then the long answer to the question is that Jonathan had gone home to the U.S. for a missions convention, I think, and he brought back a book called Unchristian um, by Dave Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons, I think. Um, and I read this book, and I remember sitting in a coffee shop in Delhi crying <laughs> like the crazy huh. person that I am <laughs> and I was broken over the statistics that were in this book and they were mainly about college-aged people 
and how they were turned off by the church and church people. And it just devastated me for some reason. I mean, it should devastate all of us (laughs) that there are people who feel that way about the church um, and people who love God. But I sat in this coffee shop and cried and I had no idea like that God was preparing my heart for something. Mm -hmm. And I really just got a burden for this age group of people that the book was primarily about, which was college aged people. And so I didn't think a whole lot about it. I went home and then I don't know what, I don't even know what the time frame was, but our district youth director came out to visit and (laughs) Before he left, he just mentioned that things were going really well with youth ministry in Iowa, but they were really missing it with college students. And I was like, well, that's weird. (laughs) And he he was like, like, if you know anybody that would be interested in starting something with college students in Iowa, you should, you know, let me know. And I was like, me. (laughs) <laughs> me, me. <laughs> so I don't think I actually like jumped up and down and said that but I, when he left I told Jonathan I was like that's us we're gonna do that <laughs> so, I don't think that he felt that right away but that was kind of the beginning of the transition for mm-hmm. us you, and you talked about like coming back to the states. You you guys felt kind of a lot of guilt and shame, and and kind of like you you had failed or something. Um, do you still feel that way at all? You know, we definitely both did feel that when we came back, and it was for different reasons. Um, I don't think that either of us feel that way now, mm-hmm. um, which is easy to say when you have the benefit Mm -hmm. of years of seeing what's going to happen. But when you're right smack dab fresh in the middle of it Mm -hmm. and nothing good has happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Hmm. Yep. We are giant failures, (laughs) (laughs) but yeah, no, it was, it's been incredible to see the way that God has, open doors for us to work with college students and then to do this church plant in Waverly. And it's hard not to believe that this couldn't have been part of the plan for yeah. us. Yeah. So we had no idea. That That's one of the things that I really appreciated about your story through the entire book was just this sense that no matter what it looked like in hindsight, you could see that God was, in the entire process from beginning to end, all the way back from when you were a kid and, and you saw your, your dad just asking questions right. all the way to now and, and moving from being a Chi Alpha director to planning a church and all that stuff. You could see that God's in that every single step of the way. Right. That was, that's something that Christians need to take to heart when they, when they're going through tough times, when they're struggling with doubts, when they're in the middle of, suffering and hell that that God's still in control even though it may seem like he's not he's he's directing your steps if you're if you're trying to to follow him Mm -hmm. right and I've I have noticed that if I just hang on long enough that I will see good Mm -hmm. yeah in what's happening yeah and it's it really is just a matter of hanging in there long enough yeah, and in 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 the, in the stories that you hear of others are often just what you need to bolster your faith enough to hang on for the next moment. Right. Yeah. Right. Like you, you know, you shared at that that women's conference. You know, her story was a huge right. inspiration to you, and and you know that's what I love about the church that I wish we would do more of is just kind of like have the testimonies of faith. <laughs> You yeah. know, because the they, genuine ones, the not ge- the yeah, yeah, the genuine ones, <laughs> the genuine ones, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but they do they they increase your faith. Like Josh and I, a couple years ago, we we went through a lot of struggles together. 
uh, separately, but together. And, and then yeah. like, I remember like one time, like they all overlapped when we were like both struggling with like, what is even the concept of faith? Like we would just ask each other that like every week, like what does this word faith even mean? You know, we just throw it around and have we ever stopped and like really just asked like, what does it mean to quote, believe in God? Like what does it, what does it mean that I believe in God? Is that that he exists, that I believe he's going to come through for me? Is it, you know, on and on and on. You just question over and over and over again. And it was in that time, just hearing other people's stories, that was such an incredible encouragement because it was like, well, if God is faithful to them, then surely he can be faithful to me because they went through something similar or way worse. And, um, you know, he, I guess he promises that he'll do it for me too, so... Maybe I could just hang on for a little bit longer. <laughs> right. But but it's in that it's in the stories like when you get that hindsight and then you're like, Oh yeah, totally. Like God was doing that, you know. <laughs> in right. my darkest moment, I couldn't feel anything. He was just right there patting me on the back. I just didn't I couldn't feel him at the time or <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The uh the the time that he was mentioning, I was I was coming out of some some personal sin and, and just really questioning, am I really forgiven? what's my relationship with God look like now? Do I have a relationship with God? And yeah, what what does it mean to actually have faith? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was okay for me to hear testimonies from other people. Um, but I had this issue where I would just think in the corner of my mind, Oh, well that's, that's just them. God doesn't really have that same grace for me. I'm, I'm different. Um, but the more I the more I listen to the stories and even reading like some of the older stories like John John Bunyan's testimony in Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, he would go through times of doubt and and stuff where he didn't feel like he was saved at all, and yet in hindsight he was able to look back and say, God was showing me grace through the entire process. Um, I think John Newton, the the guy that wrote Amazing Grace had had a similar experience um it's just over and over people throughout history tell these stories about how they doubted they mm -hmm. they didn't like god and yet god was there showing grace to them time and time again they just didn't realize it or struggled with depression like uh, i think it was charles spurgeon who would yeah suffer from such depression that he would be in bed like three weeks or more at a time you know and so great men and women of God have gone through these similar things. And it, I just think it's a shame that we have such a stigma in our culture about what seems like, if you look at history, in most people's testimonies, a completely normal part of living and following Jesus, right? Right. Yeah, I love that quote from um, Walking on Water where she says that without suffering, mm -hmm. we don't grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. how sad to think that I could have gone my entire lifetime and never experienced the things that I experienced with God. My life would be so much sadder. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and my faith would be so much smaller. Yeah. And so you got to, while it's not fun and nobody wants to go through suffering, if we can persevere, it does bring about some of the most beautiful stories. And who doesn't love to hear those stories? redemption stories mm -hmm. and, and really they serve a purpose to help others i was reading in a book um today actually i was working on uh, some coursework for for a course and it was talking about job and the suffering that job went through and how there's kind of the implication there at the end of the book of job that god kind of says the purpose for Job, or one of the results, I guess, maybe not the whole purpose for Job's suffering, was that so he could use it to help others. When then he was, when God told uh, one of his friends, he said, "I'm not going to accept your sacrifice, but if you go and have Job do it, 
I'll accept Job's on your behalf, you know, and (laughs) because Job had a different experience and he was able to reach out and help his friend in a different way. So how did your time in India shape how you think and do ministry now in the U.S.? Okay, that is really interesting because I think it's really, it's changed a lot for Jonathan and I both. Um, I don't even want to think about how we might would have done college ministry before before (laughs) India. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But we're certainly not afraid of people's doubts and questions. Um, Willing to engage that in a completely different, hopefully more authentic way. Um, definitely a lot less willing to just give easy answers and Mm -hmm. quick answers. Um, I think we listen more Mm -hmm. to people's stories. I think a lot of the things that we go through in our relationship with God, we really just need somebody to listen and walk with us. Mm. It's not that we can fix anything for anybody. Um, And that was one of the things that I really learned from my friends was they didn't try and solve my problem or make excuses for God. Um, I think a lot of times in the Christian community, we feel like when people have doubts or questions, we feel like we need to defend God Mm. and I think that a lot of a lot of times that's where things can get kind of ugly. Yeah. And God doesn't need us to defend him. Mm. He is fully capable of <laughs> defending himself. And I think those are probably the major things mm-hmm. that we took away from And we our might time. even be depriving them the opportunity to work through their doubts right you know like there's nothing worse than having somebody just try to get in your face and tell you what you should like i love i wanted to make a bigger deal of it but it's probably not worth doing so but i gotta at least mention it one of my favorite quotes in the book and i think it was actually from andy stanley but you said you had to move past the because the Bible told me so gospel <laughs> or, 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 or yeah. God. And I absolutely lo- – it's probably one of those things that is one of the most misunderstood. Like I, I can imagine a lot of people reading that and, not, and misunderstanding what you're saying. Right. But what you're talking about is just having somebody else tell you what to believe versus – Finding the person himself, Jesus, right. right, and really knowing who he is, not what a book, even a book that's the Bible, it is fully authoritative and inspired. We're, we're not denying any of that stuff, but it's still somebody else telling me versus me experiencing God for myself, right? Right. And God invites us to experience mm-hmm. him. And so we're missing out if we don't. And so, (laughs) and there's lots of ways to do that. (laughs) And so you can, I've found him in the Bible, but I found him in India too. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many ways to experience God Mm -hmm. in his goodness. Like he shows up in the craziest places. (laughs) Yeah. And so I just, I think it's, an adventure to mm-hmm. he's definitely not boring or predictable <laughs> yeah yeah that's for sure so do you still struggle with doubts about god today you know i think that well i definitely don't have all the answers and i would love to say that i don't <laughs> Mm -hmm. have doubts because I wrote this book and (laughs) it seems like there should be concrete answers to these questions. But I really didn't want to write a book that gives people answers. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write a book that 
gets people asking questions. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like some of these questions that I wrote about in the book, I'll probably be circling them until the day that I die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Because the truth is, whenever I come up against something that's hard or difficult, those same things start to play again in my mind. Oh, and yeah. Now I have this experience to look back on, but it's one of those things that I think it's just a constant mm-hmm. that you settle, you think you have it settled, and then it comes back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you get to, to answer it in a different way mm-hmm. throughout your life. Yeah, and so you, uh, that, I think you just gave the perfect answer, really, because uh, I think, well, you you gave the quote uh, in, in your book as well from from Augustine. You know, the moment you think you understand God is the moment you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so there should always be this progression. Again, it's part of why we call ourselves theology in progress, is because we want to constantly progress in our knowledge and understanding, in our relationship with God. And so even though sometimes it can feel a little monotonous or even part of the source of our struggle that we keep dealing with the same issue over and over and over again. Which, by the way, I've been there a lot. Yeah, this is, this is one of Josh's <laughs> chief issues. But eventually you find that instead of just running in circles, you're kind of like going up a spiral staircase, and, yeah. and you, you, you gain – ever more perspective, even if it's just slight, right? Right. <laughs> so even though you're dealing with other layer. Yeah. Getting written into the story. It's like the subtleties are getting even better. Uh-huh. And the relationship is getting deeper and the faith is getting firmer. And even though you might still deal with it, it's like you you'd, you'd probably say it's not it's not on the same level that you had when you first got to India. Right. Because that's that's a level of maturity now that you have developed or <laughs> faith that has been <laughs> hard pressed into you. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. That that's wonderful. So just a few more one more question, a couple more questions. We're yeah, we're, we're more. nearing the end. <laughs> one, so you you it was the line that jumped out at me the most and I've already given some that that were pretty big, but I loved this one and Josh and I were kind of texting back and forth, trying to come up with questions that we wanted to ask. And, and I read this line and I was like, okay, I got to ask you about this because I, this is where I have been for the last year is trying to find this answer, I guess. And I, so I'm, I'm curious, but you, you, you ask, what does it mean to find joy and delight in the midst of suffering? And so right. what, what, what does that mean to you now having all of this experience, all of this hindsight? I know that's what you were, you were struggling with. What is your perspective now? So, as I was praying about just this part of the book, I was like, I don't know what to say about this. How do I express the complete joy and love that I felt in the middle of the worst experiences of my life? Like, I woke up every morning and I knew that I was going to spend most of my day in the bathroom with my kids. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was probably not going to be a great day. And yet, I have never, even to this day, felt God's presence as much as I did when things just were not what I wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. Um. And so for me, I think to know that God was with me 
in the most personal and meaningful way when I was so down and discouraged was probably the best thing that came out of that entire, and it was, that was one of the last things that kind of piece of the puzzle that fell into place before we came back to the States. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Jonathan asked me, he was like, you know, we're sitting in the middle of the living room floor one night and I was crying like I did almost every day. And he was like, we can, we can go back to the States, but I don't want us to leave before it's time. And I didn't want to leave before it was time either. I wanted to get everything out of that experience. I wanted to make sure that I experienced everything that God had for me in the middle of that. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that really answered your question mm -hmm. no. of finding joy in the middle of, well, it seems like a paradox. Well, I mean, it is a paradox. It doesn't just seem like it, that there can be peace or joy in the midst of chaos and so like one of my mantras has been um comfort in the midst of chaos that i want to get comfortable in those areas of my life that are the most trying the most anxiety feel filled sometimes because uh, running's not a good strategy <laughs> um in, in the long term it's yeah, just you just have to deal with it later yeah exactly right. <laughs> Like even like when we were in seminary, sure. we used to uh, we used to have a thing which comes from another TV show, where like when we wanted to put something off, we'd say, "You know who would be really good at dealing with that? Future Chris. <laughs> I think I'm going to let him deal with that paper, but to, I'm not going to do that right now. It only just makes things worse. But you also make a point in, in towards the end of the book that that's the best place to be is in the center of God's will is at that that moment where you're pushed to your just furthest point, you know, you, you just feel like you're going to break, but it's, it's at that point where God is the most present and is the most able to use you because, you know, there you find yourself the weakest and right. it's not an easy place to be. It's, it's a hard prayer. See, I, I think even like in my mind, I've romanticized even that idea though, you know, and you can think, Oh, well, yeah, I'm just thinking about it in ministry, you know. Oh, well, okay, because then when you face troubles and you're doing ministry, well, then, you know, you feel kind of like Paul and you're being persecuted for the faith. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing my own First Corinthians 11 right That's now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole Second different ball game yeah, when Corinthians. it's like deep personal issues, you know, like your children are just sick day in and day out and you're like, wait a second, this isn't me struggling for the faith. Who... Whose life am I touching with this? What purpose does this play? I haven't left my apartment in a week. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but we, we have to understand that even in those times, you know, God is doing something and he's present with us, even though it doesn't feel like that. And so, no, I think your answer is just perfect. I, I, I love that. Um, we can still find and feel the presence of God, even in those darkest times. So I love it. Well, to kind of wrap things up, um, it, we we usually ask a few just kind of generic questions to, to all the people on the podcast. Um, don't feel like we're trying to put you on the spot, though. Um, this can just be a, as simple as you want to make it um, or as complex as you want to make it. If you want to talk for another 15 minutes, that's fine, too. <laughs> But, uh, okay, so the first one of these questions is, uh, if, uh, um, we'll ask it this way. What's, if you could summarize, what's the most valuable thing that you've learned in, uh, in the Christian life? I think that one of my biggest takeaways is, I don't know, I'm an introvert and I Preach. can be way... <laughs> way too comfortable being 
being by myself. (laughs) And I'm also an only child. And so I think one of the biggest things that I've learned about faith is that it's better when you're sharing it with a community of people. Mm. Um, It's messier (laughs) Mm -hmm. and a lot more time consuming, but so worth it. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, And I don't always do the best at it. (laughs) There are times when I just want to go hide in the rabbit hole and be a hermit. Yeah. And writing kind of lets me do that sometimes <laughs> with the excuse of I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And people are like, oh, okay. We gotta give her space. She's got to write. That's why we started <laughs> Theology in Progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I find that as I talk through things with people, whether it's for their benefit or, or for my benefit, it just is that much better. And so that's probably where I'm at right now. That's excellent. I I like it. Okay. So second question, if you could require every Christian to read two books other than the Bible or your own or your own, (laughs) of course that's on there. (laughs) Uh, what would they be and why? Oh, man. That is a tough one. I think, man, C.S. Lewis, The Screw Tape Letters. Mm-hmm. Um, That's a good one. That one really just kind of, especially <laughs> dealing with the things that I dealt with in India, for people to understand the spiritual stuff behind the scenes that yeah. we don't always necessarily understand or happening or even think about. So I think that's a good one. And then man, as far as faith goes, the one of the more interesting books that I've read here recently, was kind of a, a long, <laughs> long read and it wasn't super easy, but it was, it created some great conversations was growing young and it's about creating a church that is welcoming to all ages Mm. and what it looks like to incorporate the next generation into our churches. Mm. And that sounds really interesting. I will be checking that one out. Yeah. It was really thought provoking and it, we had some of the best conversations in our staff meeting from the stuff that we were reading in that book. So Hmm. that's a recent one that, yeah, we'll definitely have to check that out. Great. Well, Erica, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, Last question, where can people go to find out more about you or purchase Holy Doubt? (laughs) Well, Holy Doubt is available on Amazon ebook and regular hard copy book and if you want to check out more about me and I'll be getting some more resources for the book up on my website I have a free study guide that goes along with the book on my website which is www.droppingtheact.com and as always we will have links to everything in the show including Um, direct links to Amazon and to Erica's website in the show notes. So be sure to go and check that out. Once again, highly recommend Holy Doubt. It is a great book. It will keep you on the edge of your seat. You will be riveted and, um, and it will, it will challenge you personally. And I think it will enlighten you to a whole new set of realities that we often want to overlook or maybe give you the courage to speak up about your own doubts and fears. And so, and I'm sure if anybody, if, if that could be the result of the book, um, Erica would be extremely happy about that. Yes, so. I would. <laughs> <laughs> so Erica, it has been wonderful having you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. We'll talk to you later. Okay. So I just got to say it right up front. 
by far probably one of my favorite podcasts to date. Um, Definitely. We're, we're into the 60s now in, in the number of episodes that we've had, and yeah, I think I can definitely say this is my favorite so far to date. Yeah. Um, well, her story is so incredible because, well, we've talked about it a lot. I mean, our, we can relate so well. Again, maybe not with the actual experience because yeah. I've never been in India with giant yeah. rats eating, eating spiders. Your face off. Yeah, or, and, and all that. But yeah. <laughs> those same doubts and fears that make you want to question everything and being driven in so deep in depression that you're, you know, willing to take your own life and all of that sort yeah. of stuff. Like those are the things that we have experienced and and she speaks to it so well yeah it's real everything yeah. that she talks about is just genuinely real and the reason it appeals to to us so much is because we've been there we've wrestled with those kinds of doubts mm -hmm. and the more i talk to people uh really around the world the more i talk to people the more i find that that's normal in the christian life yeah we deal with these doubts and questions everybody's What's, got them What's not good is when we think that we're alone in that or that mm -hmm. we don't have the ability to even wrestle with those. When it's clear throughout Scripture, I, I'm pretty sure I can say that with certainty, that mm -hmm. God invites us to, to come and talk to him and figure out what's going on in our relationship with him. Absolutely. That's really what Philippians 2 is is getting at. Paul yeah. wants the Philippians to work out what it is this Christian life is mm -hmm. all about. You know another really good example of that though, because we were talking before we, you know, jumped on to to record this. David again, yeah, yeah, is, yeah, is such an excellent example, and you get to see him through like the Psalms, especially wrestle with what it means to follow God and to, you know, obey His statutes or live a life that's pleasing to Him or to overcome his own doubts and ex you know feelings of depression of yeah. like on one moment he's king of an entire nation, ruler of the world, right, and then the next he's like being threatened to death by his own kids. And how do you deal with stuff like that? Yeah. And, and you know, maybe our, the Christian life isn't always that extreme for us, but those feelings of highs and lows are completely natural. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I hate that we're, we kind of live in a church world where it's not okay to be open about those things where we feel like we have to hide and there's not always an easy outlet or, or we're, we don't feel comfortable going to our pastor or going to our friends and saying, Hey, look, I struggle with this. This is, this is an issue. Yeah. And I think they that, really do. It does you a disservice if you're not allowed to, to ask those questions and deal with them. Absolutely. It's damaging to your health and your spiritual well being. Yeah. So personally and to the church at large, Erica says is at the end of her book, find somebody mm -hmm. that you can talk to about this stuff. Yeah. And if you're an introvert like us, if you're an introvert like Erica, then try to break out of your shell. She says this at the end of the book, try to break out of your shell and just sit down with somebody and start talking with them. Mm -hmm. If you start to feel a connection, pursue it further, mm -hmm. but you got to find somebody. Mm -hmm. It's that important. It is. Absolutely. And we have a few resources on that as well that we've tried to, to, um, to work with, with theology and progress. So yep. maybe we sh we'll put those in the show notes. Um, some really just easy, because it seems really intimidating to kind of start like what we call the theological conversation, but it's really, it's any conversation on God dealing with these questions that you might have. I mean, that's how theology starts, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's that vital. Look, we're not meant to walk the Christian life alone. You have to have somebody, you know, for Josh and I, it sounds cheesy, but we found each other, right? Uh, <laughs> You know, but rocking we, the we, bromance. Yeah, I know, right? The bromance. <laughs> yeah, that does sound kind of bad, but uh, <laughs> you know, but for us, we have been able to struggle together, starting in seminary, and then when you moved in Iowa, and now with theology yeah, and progress, yeah. like this has been an incredible outlet for us. And so, to have somebody like Erica come along and write a book, I mean, it's just like this is the book that we've been waiting for, right? To, yeah. That somebody has oh, yeah. really ripped the bandaid off of this wound that is the festering secret of the church that everybody yeah. struggles with this. Yeah. And so, yeah, again, highly encourage you to go out and get this book. It is going to be very encouraging to you. And I, I, I know it'll challenge and help your faith grow so much. And as a bonus for sticking around this long into the episode, 
we want to give you guys a chance to get a free copy, uh, a free digital copy of Erica's book, Holy Doubt. Um, you can go to theologyinprogress.com slash holy doubt and enter for a chance to win this free digital copy. Uh, there'll also be a link in the show notes taking you to that page as well. So go there, show support for Erica and the amazing work that God's done in her life and, and her willingness to write this down. Um, and uh, we'll give you guys a chance to win a free yeah. digital copy of her book. And that contest is going to be live for about a week since the date of publish. So this should go uh, be published on May 17th. So it'll go for about a week. So if you're listening to it in that time period... Go, subscribe, or sign up, whatever it is, and um, enter to win. And hopefully on the episode that comes out next week, or the week after, somewhere in there, in in either next week's episode or the week after that, we'll announce the winner. Yeah. And uh, we'll try to, we'll contact the winner before then, make sure that they're all right with that. <laughs> but Well, this has been an incredibly long podcast for us, so I think we will go ahead and see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to the Theology in Progress podcast. If you enjoyed it, give us a like and share this episode. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our conversations. You can also support Theology in Progress through our Patreon page. One dollar an episode goes a long way to make this podcast possible. If you have questions you'd like to discuss or ideas for a future conversation, we want to know. Contact us through Facebook or by emailing Let's talk at theologyandprogress.com.